Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our results presentation for the financial year ending December 2020. My name is Ian Brown, part of the investor relations team here at Tritax. I'm very pleased to be joined here uh, today by uh, Sir Richard Jewson, Chairman of Tritax Big Box, Colin Godfrey, CEO, and Frankie Whitehead, our Finance Director. Before I hand over to Richard for some opening remarks, I will run you through some quick housekeeping points. So firstly, we are webcasting this live from our respective homes in line with government guidance. So I do hope you can see and hear us clearly. The team will run you through the results presentation and thereafter there will be an opportunity for analysts and investors to ask questions. There are two ways to ask questions. You can input them into the web chat by pressing the Q&A button, or if you'd prefer to ask your question in person, please use the raise your hand button. I will announce your name and then unmute your line, but please do remember to unmute your own device. The session is being recorded and a replay and a transcript will be made available on the Tritax Big Box website. And with that, I will hand over to uh, Sir Richard. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great that you're able to join us this morning. And I'm delighted that we are today presenting the strongest performance in the life of the company to date. The remote nature of this presentation is a reminder that the pandemic broke out a year ago and it has been a testing time for all of us. Through this period, we have been extra vigilant and sensitive, mindful of the health and well being of our staff, contractors on our sites, our customers, shareholders, and all that do business with us. I have been chairman since our IPO in December 2013, and I am proud of what we have achieved for our stakeholders over the last seven and a half years. We have grown to become the largest REIT focused entirely on UK logistics real estate, from a startup to a market cap of over 3 billion today. Having announced that I will be retiring from the board and handing over to Aubrey Adams at our AGM in May, I do so leaving the business in excellent health and with great opportunity ahead. This provides me with the chance to thank both my fellow non-executive directors who have served the company so admirably, and indeed Colin Godfrey and his excellent Tritax team who have carried out the strategy so brilliantly to deliver these sustainable and growing returns. And finally, I thank all of you who have worked with and supported the company. I now hand you over to Colin. Thank you, Sir Richard, and good morning, everyone. Well, we're really delighted to be presenting the Tritax Big Box results for 2020 and to update you on the great progress we're making in delivering our strategy. And I'm glad to say that the theme for today's update is that we've produced a really strong performance combined with sustained growth. This is particularly pleasing that we are a year into the effects of the pandemic. Briefly on our agenda, You've heard from Ian and Sir Richard, and I'll give a short introduction. Frankie will then run through the financial results and outlook, and I'll provide a strategic update following which Ian will coordinate the Q&A. So starting on slide four, you will hear from Frankie in a moment that we've delivered a really strong set of results for 2020, and we're really positive about our outlook. But I also want to emphasize that we remain well positioned to deliver ongoing strong performance, not just in the short term, but also into the medium and longer terms. This is based on the very favorable ongoing fundamentals of our market, which I will touch on later, and the benefits of a high performing, resilient and strategically positioned portfolio, coupled with expertise across all aspects of our business, and a strong platform, which allows us to drive performance by executing a clear strategy underpinned by our focus on enhancing ESG and maintaining financial discipline, both of which are critical to us. And as I say, all of this means that we're well positioned to capture the great opportunity ahead of us to deliver growing returns over the short, medium and longer terms. I'll return to these points in a few minutes, but first I'll hand you over to Frankie to run through the financial results. Thank you, Colin, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm pleased to be presenting an excellent set of financial results this morning. It's a period where the portfolio has performed exceptionally well. 
recording strong levels of rent collection and income growth. And this is highlighted by the 8% increase in adjusted earnings per share. There is also now clear evidence that the development portfolio is increasing in its contribution to overall group performance. This has helped us produce the highest level of capital growth recorded since the company's IPO with a NAD increase of 15.7% to 176 pence. Our balance sheet is very well positioned. And as a result of all of this, we continue to pay an attractive dividend, but also have confidence in generating strong levels of total return going forwards. Moving on to the next slide and further detail about the strength of our income growth. The group net rental income increased by 12%, primarily driven by our development activity. We've added 16.9 million of new rent through lettings across our development pipeline, which increases the annual contracted rent roll to just over 180 million. This rental growth alongside our stable operating costs has led to the cost ratio reducing to 14.2%, which is down from 15.1% last year. And we do expect this to fall further as high yielding assets are developed over time. The adjusted earnings per share has increased to 7.17 pence. This does include approximately 4.5 million of additional other income received via development management agreements, which is a point I will be referring to on a later slide. The fourth quarterly dividend declared this morning takes the overall position for 2020 to 6.4 pence per share which is a 2.4% increase above the six and a quarter P that we indicated during the first half of 2020. The year on year reduction in dividend is a reflection of a strategy that is delivering a greater total return focus whilst maintaining an element of prudence following COVID-19 and its impact on corporates across the UK. This positions our dividend payout ratio at 90% for the year. Moving on to slide eight, and you'll hear about our development and asset management activity later in the presentation. But these factors coupled with a very strong market has improved all key balance sheet metrics. The total portfolio value now exceeds 4.4 billion and the year on year capital performance saw growth of 9.5% across the portfolio. With development profits playing a larger role than the overall valuation surplus generated of over 350 million pounds this year. Our rent collection has been consistently strong, with 99.4% of all rent due in 2020 having been received, and the small level of arrears expected to be recovered by the middle of this year. This translates into an approximate 24p increase in EPRA NTA, up to 175.6 pence, and a very strong total accounting return delivered at just under 20% for the year all of which stems from a portfolio which provides a high quality and resilient income stream, but now with the growth opportunity provided by our significant and maturing land bank. Our LTV remains steady at 30% and the use of our balance sheet remains a key tool for us across our range of financing options. This next slide sets out the detail behind our attractive level of EPS growth driven by an increase in net rental income of 17.2 million. Starting on the left-hand side, which is the 2019 earnings position at 6.6 pence, the constituent parts of this growth include 0.6p from the investment portfolio, which includes 2% per annum of like-for-like -like rental growth across the reviews settled. New leasing activity has added 0.3p, and this is partially offset by our net disposal activity. Against this, there is a 0.5p unwind of license fees as this effectively converts to net rental income as certain developments reach practical completion. And as presented in the third to last column, this generates an EPS before growth in other income of 6.9 pence, which is a 4.1% increase over the year. Other operating income is made up of development management fees and profit share arrangements. And this has increased by 0.26 pence or four and a half million. Its contribution leads to an 8% increase in headline adjusted EPS to 7.2 pence. Now these development management fees are more variable in nature and the level recognized of 8.6 million in 2020 is in excess of our anticipated run rate, which we guide to between three and five million pounds per annum moving forwards. Uh, and we were within this range in 2019. Therefore, if removing this element of fee income, uh, our payout ratio is 93%, it 
which was also a consideration when considering this year's dividend. Slide 10, which sets out the detail behind our strong NAV growth of 15.7%. And we have adopted the EPRA NTA as our primary net asset value measure. A strengthening market, which has caused yields to tighten by approximately 30 basis points across our portfolio, along with rental growth captured, has led to the investment portfolio adding 12p to performance. Development profits captured across 2.9 million square feet of new lettings have added a further 7.5p, and significant planning consents achieved has seen planning uh, value progression across the land bank with a 3.5p contribution to NAV growth. When combined, the development portfolio and the land bank have contributed almost 50% of the overall portfolio growth. And when noting the impact of the operating profit and dividends paid in the year, this takes us to the closing NAV of 175.6 pence. Moving on, and our balance sheet is in great shape. Uh, this is a critical part of financing our strategy. And as you can see from the chart, our debt book is diverse in terms of both its maturity profile and the range of different sources, which provides us with optionality and flexibility. At the year end, we had a loan to value ratio of 30%. When considering our target range of up to 35%, this shows that we have firepower available to us and an even greater level of total liquidity when including all undrawn borrowings. We enhance this with two main events during the year, as highlighted by the red dashed lines on the slide. Uh, the first was a 12 month extension to one of the companies revolving credit facilities. And the second was our very successful 250 million green bond issue, which has a 13 year term and is attractively priced at 1.5% per annum. The proceeds of which supports our sustainability agenda and has been pledged towards green projects. The combination of these events has led to a debt maturity being maintained at approximately seven and a half years and a lowering of the company's capped cost of debt to now below 2.5%. Just before I comment on the outlook um, and moving on to slide 12, to give some perspective to the growth opportunity and the value within the development pipeline, this rental income bridge shows that we have the potential to grow the contracted annual rent from £181 million today by, by nearly two and a half times to £430 million. And just to be clear, this is without considering any additional form of market-driven income growth over and above today's levels. Included within the starting position is £18 million of rent secured under pre-lift arrangements. This is income which is all due to commence by the summer of this year, and we see this as a key factor behind 2021 earnings progression. You'll also note that we have the opportunity to capture a portfolio rental reversion of approximately 6%. Now, Colin will be updating you uh, with the progress we have been making across each of these steps, but this significant opportunity to drive value helps underpin our confidence as we think about the longer term future for our business. And so on to the final slide from me. Uh, I feel the company is in a really strong position to take advantage both of the position of its portfolio and the strength of the market and to provide some guidance across uh, some key areas. We are targeting 200 to 250 million of CapEx this year to support the development program. This is to commit to the next phase of speculative development, but also certain pre let opportunities, which we hope to crystallize during the second half of the year. As we did in 2020, we will continue to trim the portfolio and realize value but this will be linked to our ability to recycle this capital into more creative opportunities. From an earnings perspective, we are targeting sustainable levels of progression and ultimately see our future earnings growth being driven by our development pipeline. And finally, moving forwards, we will target a dividend payout ratio of at least 90% of adjusted earnings. Building in this additional flexibility will allow us to deliver upon our strategy and maximise shareholder value. We plan to commence the 2021 quarterly dividend payments in line with the 2020 level, but allowing for a potentially higher dividend in relation to the fourth quarter, whilst targeting sustainable dividend growth over the long term. So that concludes the financial review, where the execution of our strategy has led to a compelling set of financial results. 
in what is a really exciting time for the company when looking ahead. So I shall now hand you back to Colin to continue with the presentation. Thanks, Frankie. So Frankie's described our really strong performance in 2020 and our positive outlook. And I'll now spend a few minutes looking at what's behind all of that. Essentially, it's about the strength of our market and how our strategy is aligned to make the most of that to drive income and growth. So let's first look at slide 15 and the powerful long-term market fundamentals. You're all familiar with this, but I just want to highlight four points. First, top left, you can see the acceleration of online retail sales up 46% in the year. But importantly, there remains a lot of opportunity for further growth. Second, on the top right, you can see that this drove a record level of lettings in 2020, with the half million plus segment up 134% over the previous year. We started 2021 with Occupy requirements totaling 112 million square feet. And based on average take up over the last few years, it could take nearly four years for supply to match the current level of demand. Third, bottom left, shows how, shows how vacancy rates have dropped significantly. And in fact, there are only four buildings of over half a million square feet currently available to let in the UK. Finally, you can see the impact of these dynamics in the bottom right-hand graph, which shows increased investment volumes and tightening yields as investors chase scarce supply. And we believe that there's room for yield compression this year as well, which is good news for our investment assets, but also enhances the opportunity in our development land. While COVID-19 and Brexit have had a positive effect on our market, structural change is the key driver. And we believe that this is still in its infancy, giving us confidence in the significant scale and duration of the opportunity. So this sets a really positive market backdrop for our business, not just now, but into the future. And as shown on slide 16, we've designed our strategy to align with these market drivers. There are three key components to our strategy, and I'll give some flavor for each component in a moment. But in essence, you can see at the top of the triangle that we've built a platform of high quality assets attracting great customers. We've also built the capabilities to add value to these assets through direct and active management. And we use our skills in the form of insights and innovation to develop our land bank at an attractive yield on cost. And I really want to emphasize the point at the bottom here. This strategy is underpinned by a very disciplined approach to capital allocation and sustainability is embedded across our portfolio in all, all of our actions, as you'll see on slide 17, from the strong position and progress that we've made. We've handpicked and built a modern and sustainable portfolio. 90% of our floor space has an EPC rating of A to C. Also, 43% of our total floor space is certified to BRIAM very good or excellent, well above the industry average of 23%. We generated 890 megawatts of solar PV power for our tenants in 2020, avoiding over 200 tonnes of carbon emissions. We're leading by example with the aim of developing only net zero carbon buildings. DPD at Vista, uh, which completes this year, will be our first example. Our development at Littlebrook set the group's first social value targets and recorded an additional social value of £8.2 million in 2020 through local employment, community investment and procurement. And since launching our ESG strategy in mid-2020, we've made good progress against our targets. For example, our GRESP score has increased from one green star to three green stars and our MSC rating uh, has improved from B to double B. We've made good progress, but there remains a lot of opportunity for improvement. So you can see that ESG is at the very heart of our thinking and it's embedded into our strategy. Part of the strategy is portfolio composition. And as shown on slide 18, this is built on very strong foundations. As you know, we split our assets between the investment portfolio, which represents 91% of GAV, and the development portfolio at around 9% of GAV. The investment portfolio consists of foundation assets at 73% of GAV, which provides our low risk income with modern buildings, strong locations, and long-term high quality customers. 
and our value add assets at 18% of GAV, which have good capital and rental value uh, potential through active management, for example, lease three gears or, or property improvements. Allied to this is our land platform and the assets that we're developing, which gives us the opportunity to capitalize on strong market dynamics, both now and into the future. Our land is held primarily through options, which is really capital efficient and flexible. And this means that the potential for our development platform is far greater than the current capital allocation suggests. The key point here is that the quality of our investment portfolio provides long-term and highly visible growing income, which combines with significant growth potential from our development platform to deliver attractive total returns. So let's look a bit closer at the investment portfolio on slide 19 to demonstrate each of the three key points I made earlier. First, our portfolio is high quality. The charts on this slide provide further evidence of the quality that we focused on. The pie graph shown top left highlights the financial strengths of our customers and our top 10 customers by rental on the top right hints at the quality of our income. It's no coincidence that our rental income is weighted towards strong sectors such as e-commerce, food retail, logistics, and other resilient segments as shown bottom left. Noting that these customer relationships are underpinned by long-term leases, all 100% let, as Frankie mentioned. Of course, our investment decisions are underpinned by regular performance analysis, and this includes assessments of customer financial health, supply chain networks, and their requirements. Taking this together, you can see how we've delivered the first key element of the strategy, a platform of really high quality assets and strong sectors, which act as a firm foundation for long-term stable and growing income. Which leads me to our second key strategic element on slide 20, active management to drive value from within. Customer relationships and our understanding of their businesses help us support them and are key to successful active management. For us, this activity breaks down into four components. Rent reviews, which compound our income, building improvements, including extensions and sustainability initiatives, lease regears and rouletting, and selective sale and purchase of investments. Compounding and growing income is a cornerstone to our returns. Here we consider its composition and growth potential. As shown by the pie graphs, we benefit from an attractive blend of upward only rent review types with a third of our portfolio subject to open market rent reviews and half inflation linked. And while most are five yearly, 12% of our rents are delivered annually. The light show this section in the graph shows how minimum contracted uplifts will grow our inflation linked hybrid and fixed rent reviews at 1.4% per annum over the next two years. The darker shaded area highlights the additional growth potential from open market and inflation linked rent reviews at levels higher than the contracted minimums. And this reflects a potential for over 3% per annum over the next two years. Then on slide 21, let me show you how we've put that into practice, starting with what we've done in 2020. Events such as rent reviews and lease expiries provide opportunity for customer engagement and insight gathering. From this, we can help customers optimize their business plans and deliver value for our stakeholders. For example, last year, we removed a lease break option at Marks and Spencer Stoke, which extended the term by five years and forward agreed the rent review. Also at Stoke, Darnell held over on two lease expiries. Both were extended for 10 years on improved rentals. There were 12 rent reviews during the year relating to approximately 21% of our income on which we achieved like for like growth of 2% per annum. Combined with the new rents agreed on the buildings I just mentioned, we grew our income by two million pounds. And thinking back to the potential for rental income growth on the last slide, you can see here on the right-hand graph what's behind that. In 2021 alone, 37% of our rent is being reviewed with a further 27% due in 2022. So there's significant potential to capture an attractive level of rental growth over the next couple of years. 
So you can see how we have and will continue to drive value through active management across the portfolio. And as I mentioned, it's an evaluation and insight driven process which underpins our decisions as shown here on slide 22, where we look at disposals. We undertake regular and rigorous analysis of past and future performance and identifying assets which we believe have maximized returns under our ownership and where there is potential to recycle capital into higher returning opportunities. In 2020, we sold four assets above book value for a combined 134 million pounds in line with guidance, having achieved an attractive average IRR of just under 13% per annum over the blended hold period. Whilst development will be the primary target for sales proceeds, we continually look for attractive investment opportunities. I'm reminding you that over 80%, in fact, 88% of our purchases have been off market. And slide 23 shows one such example. In 2020 at Southampton, we acquired an asset off market for 44.2 million pounds, reflecting an attractive net initial yield of 5.3%, funded in part by share issuance at a premium to NAV. This is a rare temperature control facility that was just a few months from lease expiry. Our insight confirmed that Tesco wanted to stay in the building and negotiations are ongoing and looking favorable. So that's the second key element of our strategy, actively managing our assets, which leads me onto the third key strategic element here on slide 24, delivering value from our development land bank. The first thing to say here is that we own and control the UK's largest logistics focused land platform. I'll update on progress across the portfolio in a moment, but in overall terms, the next few slides, I'll cover the key metrics that explain why we're so excited about the value opportunity. The map shows the strategic nature of the locations, well diversified across 24 sites and capable of delivering up to 40 million square feet of logistics space. This would more than double the size of our company over the course of the next 10 years if we sold no investments. So this really is a catalyst for growth, as well as maintaining portfolio modernity. We will, however, look to sell investments and rotate that, inv that capital into high yielding developments with an attractive yield and cost of up to six to 8%. And this will be a key component to funding our development program. Prime yields are now below 4%. So we are looking to capture an arbitrage of over 450 basis points. And through this process, we hope to deliver attractive dividend growth. And just as a reminder, land and developments comprise approximately 8% of our GAV, but because we control much of the land via option agreements, the profit and earnings growth potential is much greater. As Frankie showed you, it has the potential to more than double our rental income. So let's return to slide 25, which highlights development progress and its increasing contribution to our performance. We secured just under 3 million square feet of development lettings in 2020, and we've grown our rent by nearly 17 million per annum. This included four speculatively developed assets, delivering an attractive yield on cost of nearly 7%. We secured planning consent on land capable of delivering 5.4 million square feet of logistics space in the year, further de-risking our land bank and acting as a precursor to securing lettings. In total, development assets contributed 49% of our overall capital value growth in the year and delivered 203 million pounds in profit. Focusing in on Littlebrook, it's a great example of what we can do. And here is a short video for you to provide a feel for the site and the progress that we've made.
Little Brook's a great example of our strategy in action, how we've deployed capital with discipline and been able to use our insights, experience, and customer relationships to drive value. Amazon's building is on phase two. And just to say that development progress has moved on from this video with Amazon having already installed significant mechanical automation. Turning to phase one, where we already have a planning consent, we recently agreed to our development partner commencing construction of a 450,000 square foot building, which is targeting completion this autumn. And finally, Landworks are nearing completion at phase three, subsequent, subsequent to which we'll be looking to submit a planning application in the coming months for a range of building sizes. So that's great progress on Littlebrook, and there's more to come. We've made significant progress with the Symmetry land platform as well, uh, as set out on slide 28. We've seen the benefits of embedding an experienced team with a proven track record within our operations. And we're really proud to have announced our commitment to net zero carbon in the construction of our developments. Since we acquired Symmetry in 2019, we have added four sites, increasing our potential development space by over 11 million square feet, more than trebled the amount of planning consented land, further de-risking the land bank, let five speculatively developed buildings totaling 567,000 square feet at a very attractive rental levels, secured a further pre-let and contributed an additional 5.3 million in rental income. Also, we've delivered 111 million in capital profit, reflecting an IRR of over 15% per annum. Our approach to development is focused on reducing risk while maximizing returns. Options over land provide flexibility, are capital efficient and significantly de-risk the development process. We typically only draw down on the option once we've achieved a planning consent, which is a value enhancement milestone. Planning is therefore a powerful development tool in reducing risk. And this is the first major stage in advancing capital full value from the development platform. And whilst we've made excellent progress, it's still early days, and there's a huge amount of potential here, making the prospects for our business very exciting. That brings us up to date for symmetry. So let's consider the development outlook overall on slide 29. Firstly, we've witnessed a significant increase in occupational inquiries over the last six months or so, equating to a current level of inquiries exceeding 16 million square feet. It also echoes the favourable backdrop I mentioned earlier, where current demand exceeds supply by several years based on recent delivery rates. We're guiding two to three million square feet of development per annum, which Frankie mentioned, uh, and this equates to capital expenditure of a broadly 200 to 250 million pounds per annum, with symmetry expected to increasingly contribute compared to the strong levels achieved by Littlebrook in 2020. We successfully let <clears throat> all five of our speculative developed buildings at or above the target rental levels, in fact, 15% above overall, including one building to Ocado and two leased to new customer Apple. Our speculative development program continues. And as a guide, we expect the run rate level in 2021 to reach around 3% of GAV, similar to the level in 2020. We now have an increasing number of planning consented sites capable of securing pre-lets and delivering speculative developments, noting that our investment policy restricts land and development exposure to a maximum of 15% of GAV, currently 8%, and within that limit, speculative development is restricted to a maximum of 5% of GAV, currently zero. All of this underpins the confidence in the numbers that Frankie covered, more particularly the opportunity for our development platform to more than double the income of our business over the course of the next 10 years. So that gives an update on how we're delivering value from our development land bank, the third key element of our strategy. And taking our strategy overall, you can see that the combination of our unique position and positive market presents a significant and attractive opportunity for us to grow and capture value. 
My penultimate slide, 30, picks up on this opportunity for growth and how we will fund it. The first thing to stress is that to maximize returns with lower risk, we must undertake development activity in a patient and controlled way to achieve a manageable and sustainable level of growth. This extends to a carefully considered and disciplined approach to the use of capital. And I'm pleased to say that we're well positioned with a range of funding sources at our disposal. This is cornerstoned by our strong balance sheet where, as Frankie mentioned, we have available firepower and will continue to manage our LTV carefully. We complement this with capital recycling from selective investment disposals as evidenced in 2020. And we will consider raising equity as part of a balanced approach to funding our strategy where it is accretive and clearly in the interests of and supported by our shareholders. Finally, we will also consider the potential for joint venture partnerships in order to provide an alternative source of capital and offer a route to share risk. The important point here is that while we see a huge amount of opportunity, we're really disciplined in the investment decisions we take and the way that we deploy capital with a clear focus on supporting accretive value growth for our shareholders. So turning to our final slide 31 and a brief summary of the key points from today's results and update. Despite the challenges of COVID-19 and the uncertainty that it's created, we've delivered a really strong set of results in 2020 and a seventh consecutive year of growth. We have a well-positioned balance sheet and the financial discipline to support our clear strategy, which is designed to deliver attractive and sustainable performance. This is backed by a strong and exciting market, both occupational and investment, supported by structural change and which we believe will remain attractive for the long term. Our market has material barriers to entry and our unique position and expertise means that we're well placed to take advantage through our high quality investment portfolio and the UK's largest development land bank. As a consequence, we're confident in delivering long-term income and value growth for our stakeholders. Thank you for listening. I'll now hand over to Ian, who will open up the questions uh, of questions uh, for your session. Great. Thanks very much, Colin. Um, and just as a reminder, there are two ways to, answer, uh, to ask a question. Um, you can use the web chat feature and type your question in. Um, or if you'd like to ask your question in person, you can press the raise your hand button um, and I will then uh, announce your name and unmute your line and you can ask your question. Um, we've already had a couple of uh, questions in on the, the web chat. So I'll, I'll, I'll take the first one here from, uh, from Robbie Duncan at Numis. He's got two questions. Um, the first one is, where in the six to eight cent target yield and cost range do you expect the next phase of developments to land? Um, and the second question is, historically, Big Box has had a 9% per annum uh, total accounting return target, um, split 6% uh, income, 3% capital. Has the target and or the composition shifted as developments become an increasingly import important part of the business? Well, th thank you, Robbie. That's uh, really helpful. Um, I wasn't quite didn't quite understand the, the second component part of uh, Robbie's question about the six to eight percent raise. You, I think you talked about cost. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, target yield on cost. And and you said where's that coming from? Uh, uh, where where do we expect? Uh, what do we expect? I suppose on the on the next phase of development. Yeah, look, um, we, we regularly. I mean, I can Frankie might want to pitch in on this as well, but we regularly. Uh, undertake um, assessments of all of our development appraisals uh, throughout the Symmetry Land Bank on a, uh, on a regular basis. And, and yeah, we're making sure all the time that the juxtaposition between value uh, and cost is carefully considered. Um, we've not seen significant cost inflation coming in yet. And of course, um, the value of the land has, has been increasing and the underlying value of the investments that we're looking to create has been increasing as well. So <clears throat> we believe that we're more than uh, keeping pace in terms of of that that value gap, as it were, um, and as a consequence, we, we we still believe that we're we're capable of delivering um, six to eight percent um, returns on a, on our development portfolio. More particularly in symmetry, it's usually sort of seven percent plus, 
Um, with, we're guiding 6% plus on our uh, Littlebrook Land Bank, which of course is in London, where, where land cost is higher. So that, that gives, hopefully gives you a, a, a good feel for the, for the range uh, of that. Um, turning to the second part of, of your question in terms of the 9% total return, y- yes, that, that was a historic guide. And I think it's important to recognise that um, the business has uh, undertaken um, you know, a, a form of evolution um, as we've matured <clears throat> in acquiring land from 2017 when we acquired the uh, Development Land Bank at Lithbrook and then subsequently in 2019 when we acquired Symmetry. Um, and this is partly in recognition of you know, the potential for slowing yield compression over time. Ultimately, it will come to uh, a halt and we think that values will hold up well. But you know, it's, it's important to recognise the value contribution that our development platform can then deliver. And we'd like to think about it more in the realms of delivering the long term sustainable returns in the upper single digits and, and the lower double digits. Great. Uh, next question comes from uh, Mike Pru, who asks, um, Big Box has a perfect rent collection record. So can you explain why the dividend payout ratio has been redefined? And in light of this, how should we think of future returns being balanced between NAV growth and dividend income, income growth, please? OK, well, that's probably one that Frankie might like to start with. Yeah, hi, Mike. Um, ultimately, it's about maximising shareholder returns. Um, I think, firstly, you know, our dividend remains very attractive, um, and we expect this to grow on a sustainable basis over the, over the long term. But we do have, you know, an opportunity with our development pipeline to drive both, you know, capital value growth um, and income growth through that development pipeline, and, and that requires investment. Um, and therefore, that's why we're guiding to a payout ratio moving forwards of at least 90% of adjusted earnings. Uh, in terms of the balance, you know, the, the total return will be continue to be underpinned by our, our strong income yield, but with a, a growing uh, capital component that will come through from the development pipeline. And I think Colin sort of touched on that in the earlier question. Great. Okay. Um, I'll take one more question from the web chat and then I'll just open and go over to the phones. Um, next question comes from um, Miranda Coburn. Um, the ERV growth of 1.3% over the year feels a bit low. Any thoughts as to what that might be and how it compares with what you are seeing? <clears throat> Thank you, Miranda. Um, look, I think the, f- the first thing to say is that valuation is a backward looking uh, principle. It's an art. Uh, it, it, it looks at um, historic data and the evidence and comparable evidence in the market. Um, So valuers are always sort of catching up with what's going on in the market. Remember, the markets change very significantly, very quickly. Um, So, you know, we're expecting that that ERV growth to accelerate. Um, That's certainly been reflected in in our lettings. I mean, if you look at the four lettings that we achieved in the Symmetry platform uh, in 2020, um, we we had two that were... Uh, on target with our uh, rental tone that we were we were expecting and, and we had in our development appraisals and three that were substantially ahead and the three that were substantially ahead were you know really a long way ahead so overall it was actually a 15.4 percent increase um over the target rental tone now we're not going to achieve that on every single building clearly but it does demonstrate what you can achieve when you've got a lease expiry uh, opportunity and i think if we're seeing those sorts of and numbers coming through in the market, we should expect to see our ERV growth and therefore our rental growth accelerate. But of course, if we don't want a boom and bust situation here. Um, you know, what we're looking for in our market, and we believe that we can deliver in the big box arena, is attractive uh, rental growth levels, which are outstripping inflation by, by a good degree and which are sustainable over the longer term. And, and given the, the low risk offer and the quality of our offer. We believe that that's a really good juxtaposition uh, to, to be looking to enjoy in the longer term period. Great. Um, I think I'll just turn to, to the phone. So um, we've got a question from Paul May uh, at Barclays. So um, Paul, I'm going to open your line up. Um, you just need to unmute yourself. Um, you should be able to ask your question. Hi guys, can you hear me okay? Morning Paul, yes we can. Good. Uh, 
great presentation, all, all you know, firing on all cylinders. Just a few specific questions from me. Um, happy to do one at a time. We can just run through them quite quickly. The is it right that uh, from H2 or sort of Q3-ish sort of time, all of the pre-let rental income will start to impact the, the P&L or start to benefit the P&L? Is that kind of the right sort of timing? Correct. Right, back end of summer, um, Paul, for, for the final one to complete this yeah, in the ground. Yeah. And is the total uplift going to be the 17.8 million of rent or is it the 19.1 million that's in the EPRA? Um, national yield table. It's sort of, there seems to be a couple of figures for rent income. It, it will be the seventeen point one. There's a bit of a timing difference between the two, but it'll be the seventeen point one. And what's the sorry, last one on that? What's the net uplift when adjusting for license fees currently being received? So broadly, you need to deduct from that around six million pounds, which will be the uh, the, the little bit contribution in twenty twenty. Um, so you're down at 11, 11 and a half million pounds as net contribution to adjusted earnings. Brilliant. And then also also linked to rents. Um, what's the, as of the end of December, what would be the gross rental income on the portfolio uh, in terms of a start point moving forward? There's various figures in the in the presentation and in, 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 in the report. So just trying to get a, a start point as a, as a guide. So... Um, passing rent poor end of December, um, I believe, was around 166 million. Okay, brilliant. Um, moving on to sort of the future, obviously, a huge opportunity coming through from the development pipeline. You mentioned the sort of CapEx expectations uh, moving forwards. What would you say is the timing of achieving the 238 million? And it's probably slightly going to be slightly more than that, 238, once we get there in terms of the the rent opportunity are we still talking a sort of six to eight years from here or or as things got longer or shorter in terms of given that um, you know the demand in the market as you mentioned well we've added uh, four sites uh, paul um since we acquired symmetry um so the <clears throat> the time bearing in mind those sites are typically if you like bolted to the back end of the timeline um so we're currently uh, still talking now about a 10-year time horizon. Um, but the majority of that's focused within the course of the next eight years. I mean, the, the joy of the Symmetry platform, of course, is that you know prior to our purchase of it, it had already enjoyed 10 years of, of progress progression, if you like. Um, and with, with each of those sites in varying degrees of, of um, a state of readiness. So you know, we bought some land with planning, some that was just about to get planning, some that was a couple of years away, and we've subsequently got planning. And I think we were, we're ahead of our, our planning delivery targets. So if, if you like, it's like a pipeline. And, and each year, um, one, a site will, more than one site will come out with planning consent. And of course, that brings us closer to the point where we can invest in infrastructure, and closer to the point where we can uh, capture those pre-let opportunities. They're reminding you that we, we've still got a number of uh, sites where we've achieved planning consent and yet where we've yet to draw down the land um, because we're in control of the timing of that process. And, and what we're doing in the background there is, is looking at and dealing with infrastructure um, and also looking to, to bring on board uh, and increase the level of um, occupational interest with you know, the ideal that we can, we can tie at least one pre-let up by the point that we then acquire the land or even part of the land because we, we often don't even need to, to acquire all of the land in, in, in one go. We can draw it down in parcels. Okay. Cool. And then finally, just, uh, and I think you touched on this, through the presentation um, or towards the end of the presentation, the, the funding of that opportunity, obviously uh, quite a large investment required uh, to achieve that. I think you've done a great job in sort of tr uh, you know, transitioning the the strategy towards the disposals that you've made and, and focusing on that capital recycling. Um, you know, it'd be great if that continues moving forward, but obviously minded by the fact you're now trading at a premium to asset value, and that's typically been a time when, when equity has been, been called upon. Um, and also with regard to the new Manco ownership structure and in terms of their focus, I presume their focus will be again to increase fees being being achieved from from the uh, the operating platform so just 
wondered how those discussions are going and what the thinking is and the sort of strategy moving forwards. Should, should, should we do a double act there, Frankie, and take that in reverse order? Look, I think the first uh, thing to say is that um, the transaction with Aberdeen Standard you know, has, has absolutely no bearing on, on the strategy for Tritex Big Box. You know, we're here to do a job. Um, it's something we discuss you know, uh, in, in great depth with our board. We've got a clear strategy set out with the board. Um, yes, we are. We've traded the premium for, for a good while now. We haven't raised any equity for, for the last couple of years. We think we've got a really good balance of, uh, of um, levers at our disposal. Um, I think, you know, it, yes, we have uh, successfully um, divested of, of some investments in the course of, the, of 2020, and we'll look to do so again. I think you'll see those back-ended this, this year because we need to be careful about the timing uh, of that against the deployment of, of prelets coming in. And we typically get a bit of... <clears throat> um, line of sight into those prelets coming forward. What we don't want to do is sell assets ahead of time um, because, of course, that will act as a drag to our income and we'll be just sitting on cash, which we're then not deploying. So, you know, you'll see us be quite careful about the timing of our, of our disposals uh, into the face of new opportunities coming through. And Frankie, do you, do you want to mention anything more on that? I mean, just, just to put some colour on um, near-term capacity, I suppose, you're looking at the balance sheet at, at 30%, um, you know, medium term guidance at between 30 and 35 percent in terms of that LTV position, you know, round numbers somewhere between 300 and 350 million pounds worth of existing balance sheet capacity. And that's prior to overlaying any disposals that, that occur in, in 2021. So, you know, there is plenty in, in the tank um, in terms of, of, of existing capacity to, to finance uh, the near term. Great. Um, Great stuff. Uh, apologies, Paul. I, 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 I inadvertently muted you there, but um, I, thanks very much. And we'll move on to um, Andrew Gill from uh, Jeffries. So, uh, Andrew, I'm going to unmute your um, line now. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much for the presentation. I've just got two questions. Um, on, on the development management fee, uh, given the strong demand in the sector, uh, what are the key factors in deciding on which sites you're happy to develop for other, uh, other investors? And um, you've got increasing experience on, on smaller and speculative assets. Are there opportunities within the portfolio outside of the land bank to add speculative developments on, on sites with low coverage? Thanks, Andrew. <clears throat> look, I think the first thing is, um, you know, we, we look to acquire uh, the best sites for ourselves um, and for our shareholders. Um, the development management agreement arrangements we have in place you pre pre-existed our acquisition of symmetry. So whilst we can offer that service, you know, it will be very selective and, and we're looking to, I mean, obviously there will be income that would be, be beneficial to our shareholders from that, but we're not going to do that um, at the expense of either distracting the team from the core job in hand. And, that, and that's essentially focusing uh, on delivering value through our development platform in the assets that we will, we will own. Um, turning to your, your second uh, question, <clears throat> look, I think um, our platform, the way we see it very crudely is that about two thirds of the land is they're very well suited to larger scale logistics assets, reminding you that it's becoming more and more difficult to find sites you know, that are big enough in the right locations uh, that don't require you know, tens, if not hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds to, in infrastructure. Um, to bring forward and, and deliver on planning. So, you know, th they are really precious. Um, and, but we think about two thirds of, of that land is, is capable of delivery for, for larger scale buildings. And around, around one third is probably better suited to smaller scale, if you like, last mile delivery. Um, sometimes as a consequence of the topography of the land, sometimes as a consequence of, of the configuration of the site, i.e. certain parts of the site you can't fit on. <laughs> A larger scale building so it naturally lends itself that way um, but we do we do believe that there's value right the way across the logistics spectrum from right the way from smaller scale buildings right the way up to the larger scale uh, mega logistics uh, buildings but uh, we also expect to remain weighted towards the larger scale buildings in the longer term because we see that there's a huge amount of benefit from those i mean the, if you look at the increase in demand in the market um larger scale logistics buildings over 500,000 square feet have been increasing their share 
uh, of total take up year after year. And there's a reason for that. It's, it's, it's because occupiers recognize the importance of these buildings, the economies of scale say, uh, benefits, the cost savings they pro can provide and how they integrate so seamlessly and are needed with automation to drive the speed and reliability that consumers have come to expect um, from e-commerce deliveries. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Andrew. Um, the next question comes from uh, Matthew Spira at, um, at Peel Hunt. So, um, Matthew, I'm just going to unmute uh, your line now. Should be able to uh, answer your question. Thanks, Ian. Good morning, guys. Um, two Hi, quick questions from me, and apologies if these have already been covered. Um, CapEx last year was just shy of 300 million. I think you talked about 250 million targeted for this year. Um, what do you think the, the likely run rate is going forwards beyond this year? Is, do you think you can keep up that sort of pace of CapEx given the land bank that you've got to, to play with? Um, and then following on from that, um, thinking about the land bank and as you progress through um, building out the, the schemes that you've got under control currently through Symmetry, um, are you looking at and are you indeed replenishing that land bank? So are you active in the market at the moment? Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Um, <clears throat> we touched on this a little bit, but but I, I will sort of re-emphasise and, and perhaps uh, cover cover this in a bit more detail. Um, yeah, the, the first thing is that in terms of run rate, we expect that to be picking up um, really uh, in 2022 onwards. Um, you know, we will, we do expect to get to somewhere close to 250 um, in 2021, a lot will depend upon the timing of, of uh, prelets, depending on whether they fall, you know, this side of the year end or, or, or the other side of the year end. But, but you know, there, there are some really good opportunities there for us. Um, so I think you can see that growing in time rather than um, staying at, at, at exactly the same level in terms of that banding, you know, the, 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 the bands that sort of up to 300 million. Uh, in terms of replenishment, and, and I think, sorry, just to pick back on that, just to remind you that this, this development demand, there's the demand right now uh, occupationally of four times the level of, of the run rate of supply over the last few years. So there's absolutely um, enough demand in the market that will drive that level in the fullness of time. Um, so I don't think we've got any concerns about the ability for the market to, to, to underpin uh, that level of spend. Um, in terms of replenishing sites, I did mention a little earlier that we've added four sites uh, to the portfolio since we acquired Symmetry. <clears throat> we will continue to look for new sites, but we're being really selective about what sites we're buying, that we're really looking for value. Um, and we're looking for sites that you know, we're not going to be waiting 10 years um, to be able to, to, to put a spade in the ground and start a vertical build on. So it's really opportunistically led. And yes, we will be looking to, to add more because... That way, we're creating value for this platform for the longer term. Perfect. Thanks, Colin. Great. Brilliant. Um, uh, the two further questions from the from the web chat. So um, uh, the first one comes from Julian Livingston Booth at RBC. Uh, he's asking, can you provide further colour on the timing of the rent reviews in 2021? One for me, Colin. Like have a go, um, Julian. I, I believe they're they're relatively well balanced in terms of timing throughout 2021, so, so nothing significant to, to factor in um, timing wise. Um, broadly speaking, 50% of the reviews uh, coming through are index linked. Around around a quarter of them are, are linked to open market value and and, and the balance um, it being being fixed. So that's the makeup. Um, you know. Indexation was slightly dragging our performance in 2020 in terms of uh, the like for like rental growth, obviously with the expectation that, that, that um, inflation starts picking up as the economy reopens. Hopefully we'll, we'll be benefiting from some of that. Um, great. Uh, and then the, uh, the, the, the final question from um, uh, Punam Ladia at Numis. Um, so two questions here. Um, uh, would it be possible to provide further colour on the extent 
uh, of this occupier interest across 16 million square feet in terms of the nature of the tenants, whether this is primarily driven by existing tenants or new tenants, so a question about the kind of composition of demand that we're seeing. Um, the, sec- the second question um, is, uh, is there opportunity to take advantage of investment appetite in the market and overshoot disposals beyond the current 125 to 175 million target level? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much for the question. Um, I suppose uh, <clears throat> in answer to the first one, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat. Would you mind taking that, Frankie? So the first one in terms of the 16 million square feet. So um, yes, we, we we do regularly look at at this. Um, broadly speaking, and this is this is broad brush in terms of the occupier interest between sort of current tenants and new tenants. It's 60 40 in favour of, of existing tenants. Um, broadly speaking, um, yeah, just, just for instance, um, you know, this year we we leased one new building to Ocado, an existing tenant, and we attracted another new tenant in, in the name of um, Apple uh, for a uh, TV studio operations we may have seen in the press. Um, so I think it will be it will be a good blend. I mean, there are clearly new names coming into the market, uh, particularly in the e-commerce field. So I think you should expect to see that grow over time. Um, in terms of, of appetite and rate of disposals, look, it, it's really a case of, of us flexing the disposals against the backdrop of the strength of the investment market to maximize returns. And also, as I said earlier, to feed uh, that capital um, into our development program uh, and to maximize efficiency of capital, we want to make sure that we're not selling too far ahead of time. Um, So to some degree, it's gonna be about the the, the speed and the quality of of, um, the pre-lets coming through. Um, in our development platform that will dictate the, the, the rate of uh, sales um, of our existing investment assets. Great. Um, that, that concludes uh, the questions that we've had at the, at the moment, Colin. So uh, I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks very much, Ian. Well, look, um, to everyone that's taken the chance to, to join uh, and ask questions today, and also to all of those that have supported the business uh, over the course of the last 12 months, thank you very much. I hope that uh, next time we we uh, get together, it will be in person. Um, it remains for me to say, look, have a, have a great uh, remaining part of your day. Uh, and uh, we look forward to catching up with you uh, sometime soon. Thank you very much for your time. Bye-bye.